the modern supercarriers of the US Navy. More than 80,000 tons of moving American foreign policy. Each one of these incredible ships carries more firepower than most nations on Earth and are thus the ultimate expression of US military might. It is said that whenever there has been a crisis anywhere in the world in the last 80 years, the first question the sitting US president has asked is, where is the nearest carrier? The first true supercarrier was the USS Kitty Hawk CV-63, commissioned into US service on April 29, 1961, at a time when a large number of World War II era carriers were still serving in the fleet. These World War II superweapons were barely half the size of Kitty Hawk, but it was their hard-earned combat experience that had made the supercarrier possible. The Kitty Hawk incorporated all the lessons of World War II, and as such seemed a world away from the era of its straight, wooden-decked predecessors. However, during the latter stages of the war, there was one carrier in service, albeit briefly, that in terms of scale could at least be considered a direct forerunner to the revolutionary 1961 ship. In today's episode, we're going to look at the background, conception, and ultimate fate of the Imperial Japanese Navy's Shinano, World War II's ill-fated supercarrier. Welcome to Wars of the World. After the armistice of November 11th, 1918, naval planners were forced to accept the fact that the war had demonstrated that battleships, which had once reigned supreme on the high seas, were no longer the last word in naval warfare. Studying the combat record of the battleships, they had played a significantly less decisive role than had been anticipated prior to 1914, while smaller vessels such as cruisers and especially destroyers took on a wide plethora of roles while costing only a fraction to build. Furthermore, the introduction of powered, high-explosive torpedoes meant that even a small destroyer now had the firepower to seriously challenge a battleship. But it was this new weapon, coupled with two other new innovations in naval warfare, that appeared to truly signal the end of these naval goliaths. Firstly, the submarine proved very early in the war to be capable of neutralizing even the largest of battleships, often without the target crew even knowing they were under attack until it was too late. Secondly, aircraft had grown exponentially in capability during the war, to the point where they had gone from light observation types to now being able to carry large torpedoes and heavy bombs. However, you can't simply change the old mindset overnight, after some 80 years of building powered battleships, with the philosophy of bigger is better. Presented with this new reality of aircraft and submarines, naval planners became split into two separate camps. Those who clung to the notion that no matter what, the battleship's firepower and armor would keep it on top in any future naval conflict, and the other, who saw the battleship as rapidly approaching obsolescence, and felt the money and resources they consumed would be better invested in new weapons systems. For the latter group, the Washington Naval Treaty of 1922 helped tip the balance in their favor, since the agreement aimed to limit the number of battleships sailing in the world's oceans as part of an overall diplomatic effort intended to prevent another great war. This also meant that a number of battleship hulls laid up in construction yards were now technically illegal, and so many were converted to some of the first aircraft carriers. However, the argument over whether the battleship or the carrier would be king in the future was never truly settled before the outbreak of World War II, despite the growing evidence that battleships were becoming even more vulnerable with the continued rise of aircraft and submarines. But the old guard who supported battleships were simply too strong to dislodge. Only two of the great powers that emerged from the Great War seemed somewhat exempt from this debate, although for wildly different reasons. 
The first was the Soviet Union, which, following the October Revolution, found itself inheriting a ragtag fleet of various old battleships from the days of the Tsar's navy. With the new Soviet regime almost solely preoccupied with land warfare given the expanse of its borders, the Red Army always took priority, with the Soviet Navy scrapping all but four of its battleships, sparing only the four recently completed numbers of the Gangut class, and even these were left largely neglected. The other power was Imperial Japan, which since the start of the 20th century was on the rise toward becoming the first true Asian superpower. Being an island nation, the Imperial Japanese Navy took on special importance when it came to protecting the empire, particularly as Japanese leaders started their plans for expanding further into Southeast Asia and out into the Pacific, something that would almost certainly put it at odds with the old European and American powers. Building up its strength in the 1920s and 30s, Japan produced a vast surface fleet of ships, predominantly destroyers and cruisers, but was also one of the few to launch new battleships in the immediate post-war era, namely the two ships of the Nagato class. At the same time, and with both official and sometimes unofficial assistance from British engineers, Japan was also building up a significant aircraft carrier fleet, and was gaining vital experience in naval combat operations during the growing conflict in Manchuria. Under the guidance of gifted leaders such as Admiral Yamamoto, Japan would build the most powerful carrier fleet in the world by 1941, backed up by a large land-based bomber force. Thus, Japan was probably one of the most balanced navies in the world in terms of technology and operational doctrine. But even so, there were those in the Japanese leadership who still expressed a desire to produce a new, ultra-modern battleship that could challenge any battleship of the US or Royal Navies. Between 1934 and 1937, the Japanese Navy studied 23 separate proposals for their new super battleship, the likes of which the world had never seen before settling on a final configuration which was immediately ordered into construction under a veil of absolute secrecy. Weighing in at nearly twice the previous Nagato class, at 71,000 tons when fully loaded, the Japanese planned four of these awe-inspiring battleships, which would sport nine massive 18.1-inch main guns, the largest ever mounted on a battleship. These incredible guns could fire 3,240-pound high-explosive shells out to a range of 41 kilometers. The new super battleships were intended to deliberately challenge American battleships, knowing that the Americans were curtailed in ship size by the vital Panama Canal. Any American battleship built that could seriously challenge the new Japanese super battleship would be unable to fit through this canal, and thus, if they had to deploy from yards or bases on the east coast, it would take them a vast amount of time to sail around the tip of South America, during which time the Japanese ships could run amok. Even then, the Japanese weren't satisfied, and were already considering building follow-up ships with 20-inch guns. For reference, the US Iowa-class battleships came packing nine 16-inch guns, in a hull just two-thirds the size of the new Japanese ships. The first of class, Yamato, was completed barely a week after the attack on Pearl Harbor, and quickly served as Admiral Yamamoto's flagship. It was followed soon after by the second super battleship, Musashi, and great things were expected of them. And yet, almost immediately, these incredible vessels, which rightly deserve the title of the ultimate battleship, found themselves playing second fiddle to Japanese carriers. As well as devastating the American fleet at Pearl, Japanese planes had also delivered another key victory for the Imperial Japanese Navy, when they sank the British warships HMS Prince of Wales and HMS Repulse. They were also the deciding factor during the Battle of the Coral Sea in early May of 1942. What is so fascinating about this particular battle was that neither side's ships ever saw one another, the weapons used being aircraft, with the ship's guns only serving for defense. With this new reality finally being accepted by the world's admirals, the loss of four of Japan's carriers during the Battle of Midway in June 1942 was appreciated as the point where Tokyo's plans for conquest in the Pacific came to a crashing halt. It was a blow that Japan would never recover from. Meanwhile, for all the pride and prestige bestowed upon them by the Japanese people, 
The super battleships had rather uninspiring combat careers, neither living up to their promise until both were eventually sunk by American aircraft in the latter stages of the war. The truth was that had these battleships appeared 20 years earlier, they would have been invincible. As it was, they were suffering a fate akin to the sword-wielding samurai of old when faced with enemies equipped with new weapons that could kill from afar. On May 4th, 1940, a third battleship built to the Yamato's awe-inspiring specifications was laid down at the Yokosuka Naval Yard, and by the outbreak of war with the US, the hull, which was to be christened Shinano, had been built up to the main deck. Work had also begun on a fourth vessel, designated only as Hull No. 111, but was at a significantly less advanced stage. Construction was then halted in the immediate aftermath of the attack on Pearl Harbor, and in the coming months, questions over the necessity of these two new super battleships began to creep into the minds of Japanese admirals. The losses at the Battle of Midway only fueled the growing opposition to building such costly battleships, especially when the Japanese Navy was now scrambling to try and replace their lost carriers. A number of civilian ships in Japanese possession were quickly put into yards and were rebuilt as crewed aircraft carriers, including the German liner SS Scharnhorst, which found itself trapped in Japan at the start of the war. Unfortunately for the Japanese, these vessels often lacked many of the features associated with true carriers, at times being simply floating runways. If this were not enough, the Japanese naval leadership also seemed to find themselves muddling through this crash carrier program with often odd and downright baffling decisions being made, which consumed time and resources for very little, if any, benefit. It was against this desperate backdrop that the Japanese began to look at the immense hull of the third Yamato class at Yokosuka and seriously consider repurposing the vessel as a supersized aircraft carrier. Having conducted feasibility studies, the results on paper proved jaw-dropping and could theoretically help resolve Japan's increasingly dire carrier situation in a big way, to say the least. Fitted with a flight deck extending the length of the ship and a hangar deck below for storage and maintenance of the aircraft, the resulting carrier would be the largest ever put to sea by a considerable margin, stretching 840 feet long at the waterline displacing 68,000 tons even without its aircraft, and possessing an air wing of up to 150 fighters and torpedo bombers. For comparison's sake, it was more than twice the size of the US Navy's USS Essex fleet carrier. As the work got underway, it became clear this was not going to be a simple conversion. Much of the machinery and infrastructure for her role as a battleship had already been put in place and was going to have to be removed in order to make Shinano the supercarrier it was hoped she would be. However, it was at this time that another train of thoughts began creeping its way in concerning the vessel's use. Now, there were those in the Japanese Admiralty who instead saw the Shinano not as an operational fleet carrier, but instead as a support carrier. Under this new concept, Shinano would act as a floating resupply ship for other aircraft carriers, carrying fuel, munitions, spare parts, and other supplies. During combat, aircraft from other carriers would land on the supersized carrier, refuel and rearm, and then take off on another combat mission. The belief was that this would dramatically increase the turnaround rate for Japanese warplanes in any battle. But this was seen as a waste of the ship by those who wanted Shinano to be a true fleet carrier. Thus, Shinano found herself at the center of a bureaucratic tug of war between the opposing camps. In the end, those in favor of the support carrier idea won the debate, but the conversion work was slow and frustrating due to a number of factors, not least of which was the growing threat from American planes flying over the home islands. It would not be until October 8th, 1944 that Shinano would be launched, by which time the Japanese admirals were crying out for the vessel to get into the fight against the Americans, having just lost two more fleet carriers and an escort carrier at the Battle of the Philippine Sea on June 19th, 1944. Then on October 24th, one of Shinano's battleship forebears Musashi was sunk by American aircraft of Task Force 38. Right from the start, the ship had an aura of misfortune surrounding it, 
During the launching ceremony, the vessel was slightly damaged when one of the watertight structures holding back seawater at the end of the dock broke free, allowing a gush of water in which moved the carrier forward, causing it to strike the dock. This was seen as a bad omen by those who saw it happen. By November, the ship had almost taken its final form, sporting an 839-foot-long flight deck, which, following the experience at the Battle of Midway, was armored to a depth of 2.95 inches. Like most Japanese carriers by that time, Shinano was well-armed with 16 5-inch guns, 145 25mm anti-aircraft guns, and 336 5-inch anti-aircraft rocket launchers. Once operational, it was also expected the support carrier would have a defensive air wing of around 40 fighters. Power was derived from 12 water tube boilers, generating 150,000 horsepower, which turned four enormous propellers that gave the carrier a top speed of 28 knots, an impressive figure for a carrier of its size. The detection of an American reconnaissance plane flying over Yokosuka rattled the nerves of the Japanese admirals as Shinano began a series of limited sea trials under the command of Captain Toshio Abe. Having been formally commissioned into the fleet on November 19, 1944, Abe was ordered to sail the supercarrier to Kor in the Hiroshima prefecture, where it was felt it would be safer from American air attacks. However, Abe protested these orders. There was still a great deal of work to be done, including a number of safety features that were incomplete, while the crew on board was not at full strength nor fully trained, forcing him to enlist dock workers familiar with the ship to join them in going to sea. However, the Japanese admirals were taking no chances, fearing an American attack at any moment, and ordered him to sail on the evening of November 29, 1944, hoping the darkness would shield the carrier from any roaming American planes. No fighters or bombers were on board when the vessel departed. Instead, Shinano carried 50 one-man Oka Kamikaze glide bombs and six Shinyo suicide boats, which were being delivered to Kur before they were to be shipped out to the front lines. Escorting the carrier were three destroyers, all of whom had recently returned from combat. It was not long into the journey before Abe was informed that the carrier group had become aware of at least one US submarine operating in the area which he reasoned could be part of an American wolf pack. However, unknown to the Japanese, only one American submarine was nearby, namely the USS Archerfish, under the captaincy of Commander Joseph F. Enright. Enright's crew had been cruising on the surface when they had detected the carrier, and initially thought it was a tanker given its size. But while a tempting target, the slower submarine was unable to give chase. Then, to Enright's surprise, the target began zigzagging, significantly slowing its progress and allowing his submarine to catch up to it. It was only as he closed in that he discovered he was tailing a carrier, and a large one at that, and so he prepared to attack. Having dived to begin his attack, shortly after 300 hours, Enright saw his target turn east, and in doing so, presented him with an ideal opportunity. One by one, at 315 hours, six torpedoes were spat out at the 1,500-ton submarine and sent straight for the 68,000-ton carrier, and approximately 60 seconds later, four of them found their target. The rear half of the carrier was rocked by external explosions that tore into the ship, while streams of water shot up alongside the hull. Meanwhile, Enright fled, knowing that the three destroyers would now be hunting his submarine although he and his crew managed to escape scot-free, despite them dropping depth charges. The reason for the zigzagging pattern the Shinano had taken was that Abe was laboring under the belief that there was more than one submarine in the area. As such, zigzagging would have made the vessel a more difficult target to attack. He couldn't have known that with only one submarine in the area, he had effectively allowed Commander Enright to catch up and present him with a target he simply couldn't ignore. Holed by the torpedoes, water began flooding into the ship, which soon developed a list around 10 degrees to starboard. However, Abe was confident that damage control procedures would save the ship, and so he ordered the engine room to maintain 18 knots in an effort to escape a second attack from the wolf pack he was so sure was surrounding them. Unfortunately for him and his men, all the reasons he had protested the order to sail were now manifesting themselves below. 
Many of the planned watertight doors which would have contained the flooding were either improperly closed by the terrified crew, or were simply not installed before leaving Yokosuka. As such, seawater continued to pour into the ship, consuming every space it reached, even where the doors were fitted properly and secured. Water was getting in via damaged piping and wires which hadn't been made watertight as they transited through the bulkheads. However, the situation was even worse than that. The exploding torpedoes had started numerous fires, and while Shinano was fitted with firefighting equipment, the crew were not trained to use it properly. In some areas of the ship, despite hoses and pumps being nearby, the crew took to creating a bucket chain, passing pails of water from one man to the next in a vain effort to extinguish the fires. Senior officers attempting to control the situation also found themselves having to contend with the terrified dock workers that had been forced to serve on board, now refusing to take orders and demanding they abandon ship. As the first light crept over the horizon, reports of the situation down below filtered up to Abe, who realized that the situation was far worse than he had initially thought. He finally began reducing speed, but it was too little, too late, and he came to realize that his ship would never make it to core. His only hope now was to try and correct the increasing list to starboard by counterfludging the engine rooms on the port side, and then affix tow lines to the escorting destroyers, which could hopefully drag the wounded ship to shore, where it could be beached. The counter-flooding worked briefly, but before long, the starboard list had increased to such an extent that the water inlet valves being used on the port side to balance the flooding were out of the water and rendered ineffective. As for the efforts to beach the mighty ship, the 2,000-ton destroyers were of almost no help trying to move the carrier, lacking the power to guide the sinking behemoth anywhere. Not that it mattered, for soon the tow cables snapped. By mid-morning, the list began to reach 30 degrees, and Abe finally accepted that all was lost. At 1018 hours, he ordered the crew to begin abandoning the dying supercarrier. As was customary in the Japanese Navy, both the portrait of the Emperor and the immaculate new flag of this still very new ship were recovered by the crew, the portrait being tied to Petty Officer Yamagishi's back before he leapt into the sea. Shortly afterwards, Shinano could take no more and capsized, before slipping beneath the waves at 1055 hours, taking 1,435 officers, sailors, and civilian workers with it, including Abe. When it sank, Shinano had only been in commission with the Japanese fleet for 10 days. It remains the largest aircraft courier to have been sunk in wartime, and the largest vessel ever sunk by a submarine. Shinano would hold on to its title of the largest carrier ever built for nearly 17 years, until the launching of the US Navy's USS Kitty Hawk finally dethroned it in 1961. And there you have the tale of Shinano. Please leave a comment down below with your own thoughts and reactions, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.